keynote speaker, Dr. Rebecca Poole. Dr. Poole is a professor with the Department of Human Development and Family Services at the University of Connecticut. She's also deputy director for the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Health at the University of Connecticut and who was previously at Yale University. She's also been a research scientist with the Department of Psychology at Yale University. She received her MS and master's degree from Yale University in psychology. She also has a PhD from Yale in clinical psychology. She has authored over 150 peer-reviewed articles that have focused on weight and weight stigma and obesity. In 2021, she was named the world's highly, named to the world's highly cited research list and received an award termed the Obesity Canada's Distinguished Lecturer Award. So he, she has um, extremely high credentialing in this area of uh, the stigma associated with um, overweight and obesity. And we welcome Dr. Poole and look forward to her presentation. Dr. Poole. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to be speaking to you all today. I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to discuss the topic of weight stigma in youth. And my presentation this morning will focus on what we know about weight stigma and its impact on children and adolescents and the implications for addressing this problem in pediatric care. And the only disclosure uh, that I have this morning is grant funding from WW, which is uh, formerly uh, Weight Watchers. So I'd like to cover several primary topics in the time that I have this morning. First, I'd like to provide a summary of the nature and extent of weight stigma in youth, and then I'll share with you evidence of the psychological and physical health consequences of weight stigma and discuss the roles that internalized bias and coping responses play in worsening health. And then I'm going to focus on some key strategies to reduce weight stigma in clinical practice with a particular emphasis on how we communicate about weight with youth and families. So let me first begin by briefly defining weight stigma, which can be broadly understood as social devaluation of people because of their body weight or body size. And at the foundation of this stigma are strongly ingrained stereotypes that people who have a higher weight or a larger body are lazy, gluttonous, lacking in willpower and discipline, unmotivated to improve their health and personally to blame for their weight. And these societal stereotypes are pervasive and they set the stage for different forms of victimization and prejudice and unfair treatment. And in children and adolescents, weight stigma is most commonly experienced as teasing, bullying, or harassment, which collectively we typically refer to as weight-based victimization. And this can take many different forms, it could, just like other forms of bullying can. So it can include verbal teasing, cyberbullying, physical aggression, or relational victimization. And these forms of victimization also come from multiple sources, not only from peers, but as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, also from trusted adults like teachers and even family members. And it's important to acknowledge that the experience of weight stigma is not unique to a certain time period in a person's life and that it really is present and can persist throughout the lifespan. So we know from research that weight stereotypes are present in children as early as preschool and that these continue throughout adulthood. So for people who have a higher weight early on in their life as a child or as an adolescent, confronting weight stigma can be a lifelong struggle. And it, it can begin in childhood as subtle teasing or social exclusion, but then it escalates into different forms of teasing and bullying as children get older. And that can extend over time to include unfair treatment and discrimination. And so this lifespan context is important to consider when we start to think about the nature and the health consequences that can come from weight stigma. And before I jump into a discussion of weight stigma in children, I do just want to quickly comment on how prevalent this is in adults. So across national studies in the U.S., 
Prevalence estimates of weight discrimination for people who have obesity range from about 19 to 40%, with the highest rates of weight discrimination among those with the highest BMI. And one of the first uh, studies that we did examining prevalence uh, using a national US data set uh, really compared the prevalence of weight discrimination to other forms of discrimination. And we found that weight discrimination is one of the most common forms that are reported by American adults, uh, particularly for women. Now, for many people, these experiences begin in childhood and adolescence. And in recent research of ours, we've surveyed large samples of adults who are currently struggling with weight and actively trying to manage their weight. And we find that almost half report that they first experienced weight stigma during childhood or adolescence. We also found that people tend to report the frequency and the distress of weight stigma as being much higher during childhood and adolescence compared to later time periods in their lives. And so the, the detrimental impact of weight stigma may actually be at its worst during these earlier time periods. And consistently in the literature, we see that youth who have overweight or obesity are more commonly bullied because of their weight than youth with lower body weights. So as a child's risk of being bullied about their weight increases uh, with BMI, and, and these findings persist regardless of factors like race or ethnicity, socioeconomic status, academic achievement, or social skills. And when we look at the prevalence rates of weight-based bullying in diverse samples of youth with respect to things like weight and, and race ethnicity, we see that at least a quarter to almost a half of girls are reporting weight-based bullying. At least 20% to over a third of boys are. The studies that I've highlighted here on this slide primarily refer to adolescents. And if you look at the first row of this table, this involved a very large sample of ethnically diverse adolescents. And these youth were more likely to be bullied about their weight um, than for their race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or disability status. And when we survey adolescents about what they see happening at school, it appears that weight bullying is viewed to be the most common form of peer harassment. So the data that I've shown here are from a study that we did with about 1,500 adolescents, and we asked them what they observed to be the most common type of bullying um, towards their peers at school. And as you can see here, um, having a higher body weight was the most frequent reason for bullying that students witnessed. Of additional concern in the study, we found that 95% of adolescents reported that they observed weight-based bullying and 75% reported that they witnessed these incidents at least sometimes or often. And our work with youth who are targets of weight-based bullying show just how pervasive these experiences can be. So as an example, our team conducted several studies with adolescents who are enrolled in weight loss camps. And we found that 90% report being teased or bullied about their weight by their peers. And over three quarters had been bullied about their weight in the past year. Most of them reported that this bullying had lasted for, for several years. And when it comes to gender and risk of weight-based victimization, there are kind of some mixed findings with respect to the frequency and the types of these experiences for girls and boys. But typically, we see that rates of weight-based teasing from peers are higher in girls compared to boys. Um, certainly, both boys and girls are vulnerable to verbal teasing about weight, but girls tend to be... Um, more likely to report relational victimization than boys. So they're more likely to be socially excluded from their peers because of their body weight um, or being the target of things like rumors or rejection in close relationships with friends, um, where typically we see sometimes higher rates of physical aggression due to weight in boys. And it's also important to consider the role of race and ethnicity here as well. So of the research evidence that has studied these relationships, we see that weight-based teasing is reported by girls and boys across racial and ethnic minority groups. So the study I've highlighted here is a nice illustration of this, which shows that weight-based victimization is present across these different racial ethnic groups at fairly similar rates. You can also see that percentages are higher in girls across these groups compared to boys. And it's also worth mentioning here that um, weight-based harassment in this study was the most common form of peer harassment. So it was reported by about 22% of the whole sample, and that was more than twice the percentage of youth who reported harassment because of their race, sexual orientation, gender, or disability. So it's important to recognize that youth of different racial ethnic backgrounds are certainly vulnerable to these experiences. Now, 
While we might not be surprised that peer-based victimization is common, it is somewhat unexpected that we see fairly high percentages of people reporting that they've been teased and stigmatized about their weight from teachers. So I've highlighted three of our studies here, which include adolescents, um, adults with high BMI, and as you can see, about 27 to 42 percent report that they've been stigmatized about their weight from teachers. And this includes classroom teachers, physical education teachers, and also coaches. And uh, we've done some experimental research to examine what potential impact these biases from teachers might have on students. So in one of the studies that we've done, which I've highlighted here, we randomly assigned teachers in our study to one of two conditions. In one condition, they viewed the pair of photos that you see at the top of this slide. In the second condition, they viewed the pair of images that you see on the bottom. Now, these are the same students in both pictures, but the top photos were altered to make the students appear thinner. And in each of these conditions, we asked teachers based on the photos they looked at, what their expectations would be of these students. And we found that teachers had higher and better expectations for the thinner students. They expected these students to have better abilities than the, than the uh, pair of photos you see at the bottom. The teachers who viewed the bottom photos also expressed more negative stereotypes about the students with larger bodies and those who viewed the thinner images. And in particular, Teachers expected the girl with a larger body size to have inferior physical abilities, reasoning skills, cooperation skills, and social skills compared to the thinner girl. And these findings remained regardless of teacher's gender or BMI or years of experience. And so these findings tell us that body size of students can affect how teachers judge them and how they assess their skills and abilities. And our sense is that students might be aware of these weight biases among teachers, because in some recent research that we've done, we found that adolescents have a lot of reasons that they don't want to report weight-based bullying to teachers, including the view that teachers aren't going to do anything to address the issue or that it will just make the situation worse. So when we think about weight stigma in the school setting, it's important to acknowledge that we're not just talking about peers here. This is also coming from educators. And given the reluctance of students to report these experiences, efforts to intervene in the school setting need to prioritize ways for students to feel supported enough to, to talk to trusted adults. Now, in addition to this, what is particularly concerning is research documenting that parents and family members are also sources of weight-based teasing towards youth. And I've highlighted some of our studies here where we've simply asked adolescents and adults about the interpersonal sources of weight stigma that they've experienced in their lives. Family members are often one of the most common sources reported. And you can see here how high these percentages are for how many people report that they've been stigmatized about their weight by parents or family members. The lowest is more than a third of people and the highest is almost three quarters. And in our studies, we've observed that um, the emotional damage of being stigmatized about weight from family members is particularly impactful and long lasting. And typically, uh, weight teasing in the form of stigma is, is most often studied in the context of family relationships. And, and just like with weight teasing from peers, we see that weight teasing from family is more often reported by girls than boys. And it's present across different racial and ethnic groups of youth. Uh, family weight teasing is more likely to be present when parents express concerns about their child's weight, which is typically positively associated with how frequently the mother is dieting to lose weight herself. But it is important to note that weight teasing comes from both uh, mothers and fathers. And the way that parents talk about weight with their children can, can really play an important role here. So there's increasing research that has studied something called parental weight talk, which includes critical comments that parents make about their children's weight, such as pressuring their child to diet or making comments about their physical appearance. And parental weight talk like this is associated with negative outcomes, particularly for girls, like emotional distress, disordered eating, and harmful weight control practices. And some of our recent research has found that parents parents' own experiences of weight stigma may also affect how much they talk about weight with their child. So the more that they've experienced stigma themselves because of their weight, the more that they engage in weight talk. We do also see evidence, though, that parents engage in weight talk regardless of their own BMI or weight experiences or demographic characteristics. And, and then in general, weight talk is a pretty common phenomenon in parent-child relationships. 
Now, a question that has emerged over the past couple of years is, is whether weight-based bullying could have subsided during the pandemic, given that so many kids weren't in school. We did do some preliminary research at this, looking at this um, in 2020 in a sample of adolescents. And unfortunately, what we found is that from youth perspectives, weight-based teasing and bullying didn't change at all. So at least three quarters reported no change in weight teasing from their peers or their parents, and some even reported an increase in weight teasing during the pandemic. Um, again, these youth were more likely to be girls and those with the highest body weight. Um, and those who reported higher rates of bullying had worse body dissatisfaction during this time period. So given the evidence of how common weight stigma is towards youth and that this occurs in close interpersonal relationships, how is weight stigma impacting emotional and physical health of children and adolescents? So weight stigma has many negative influences on health. And in addition to the emotional distress that youth experience because of weight stigma, it also directly impacts their eating behaviors, their level of physical activity, and their body weight itself. And this evidence has been found in both community and treatment-seeking samples of youth, and regardless of whether weight-based teasing comes from peers or parents. And of the considerable research in this area, many studies control for variables like BMI and age and timing of obesity onset in youth. And that's important to highlight because it tells us that it's not body weight per se that is linked to these negative outcomes, but rather it's the experience of weight stigma that is directly contributing. So I'm going to spend some time talking about these different negative health consequences. So first, there's considerable evidence that children who are victimized about their weight in the form of teasing or bullying are at higher risk for a range of negative psychological consequences. These include higher levels of depression and anxiety, lower self-esteem, poor body image, and higher substance use. And of concern, research has shown that adolescents with obesity who are teased about their weight are two to three times more likely to be engaging in suicidal thoughts and behaviors compared to their same weight peers who are not bullied. Unfortunately, we have seen increasing reports in the media of teens who have committed suicide in part because of weight-based bullying that they've experienced. And this emotional distress seems particularly pronounced for girls. So as an example here, this is a study of ours um, with just under 400 adolescents who reported that they had been bullied about their weight during the past year. And compared to boys, girls reported more negative emotions like feeling sad, depressed, worse about themselves, badly about their bodies, and, and also generally angry. Boys did report these emotional responses too, but at lower rates than girls. And perhaps in part because of these psychological consequences, adolescents who report that they're teased about their weight at school more likely to indicate that their grades are harmed because of these experiences, and they're more likely to avoid going to school. So in one of our studies that I've highlighted here, the odds of adolescents reporting that their grades were harmed and that they avoided school increased by 5% per teasing incident, even after we accounted for their grades and their weight status and their race and their age. And so academic implications of weight stigma are also important things to be looking out for. Now, beyond these outcomes, we know that weight stigma contributes to poor physical health, and a somewhat surprising finding in the literature in prospective studies shows that experiencing weight stigma is longitudinally associated with weight gain over time. Now, this is important to highlight because there remain some common public perceptions in our society that stigma will motivate people to lose weight or will provide an incentive for weight loss. But the evidence indicates that the opposite is occurring, that stigma is in fact predicting increased weight gain and reinforcing obesity. Now, most of this evidence has focused on samples of adults, but emerging research is also focusing on youth. So as an example, I've, I've shown a, a study here of ours, a longitudinal study that I did in collaboration with Diane Newmark Steiner at the University of Minnesota. And she's the PI on a longitudinal cohort study called Project EAT, which has followed almost 2000 adolescents for more than 15 years into their mid thirties. Now at the baseline of this study, participants were adolescents, they were about 15 years old, and they were asked how often they were teased about their weight and whether the teasing came from peers or family members or both. And what was found is that weight teasing at that time in adolescence predicted a number of negative health consequences 15 years later. So when it came to weight, women who had been teased about their weight in adolescence from either their family members or their peers had more than a two times increased odds of having obesity as adults. 
For men, the same pattern emerged if they were teased about weight from peers, but not from family members. And so these findings tell us that, that weight teasing can have long-term implications for weight status, independent of baseline characteristics and weight. And so a question here is, why are we seeing this pattern? Why is weight stigma leading to weight gain? Well, there are several mechanisms that are likely at play here, and one is physical activity. So gym class is a very common setting where youth are made fun of about their weight. In several of our studies, we found that 85% of high school students witness their peers being teased about their weight, specifically in gym class. And among those with high BMI, over 70% said that they'd been teased about their weight in a physical acti activity setting. And 42% said that this teasing had actually come from a physical education teacher or coach. And when these experiences happen, youth are more likely to avoid physical activity. They're more likely to skip gym class and they report lower levels of being physically active and they have less self-confidence in being physically active and lower enjoyment of sports in general. Now, another consequence of weight-based teasing and bullying is maladaptive eating behaviors, which obviously has implications for weight gain. So there's considerable evidence on this topic, which shows that youth who experience weight-based teasing are more likely to engage in binge eating and emotional overeating. Um, they're more likely to increase their food consumption and engage in unhealthy dieting and weight control practices. And these maladaptive eating behaviors are more frequent in youth who experience more frequent weight teasing. And for girls, binge eating is particularly prevalent when weight teasing comes from family members. And we don't typically see that as much in boys. Now, unfortunately, these associations um, with weight-based bullying and unhealthy eating patterns remain present for many years uh, throughout adolescence into adulthood. And I do just want to highlight uh, some of the findings on binge eating for a moment, since these are so pronounced in the literature. So youth who experience teasing or bullying have a significantly higher likelihood of engaging in severe binge eating. And the earlier that weight teasing starts, the more likely they are to become regular binge eaters in adulthood. Um, binge eating is also more likely if kids are experiencing multiple forms of weight teasing, like both verbal teasing and cyberbullying, and if they have a higher frequency of these experiences and more distress from these experiences. Now, one of the reasons why these links with maladaptive eating might be present is that people can cope with the emotional distress of weight stigma in ways that reinforce unhealthy eating behaviors. So as an example, about 15 years ago, we began to look at how people were coping with weight stigma. And we studied um, over 2,400 women who were members of a self-help weight loss organization. And women reported using all sorts of different coping strategies to deal with weight stigma. Some of those strategies were positive, like seeking social support, and some were negative. And a striking finding was that almost 80% reported that they tend to turn to food as a temporary coping mechanism when they feel stigmatized, that eating was a way to temporarily relieve their distress. And as we know from the psychology literature, stigma is a stressor and eating is a common coping strategy in response to stress. So that certainly makes sense in the context of these weight stigma findings. And unfortunately, we are seeing these maladaptive eating coping responses um, in youth as well. So as an example, in the study here that I've showed you, um, which we did with youth and adolescents who had been teased or bullied about their weight in the past year, we found that both boys and girls who report emotional distress in response to weight-based bullying are more likely to cope by eating more food, binge eating, and avoiding physical activity. So those, these responses can really set the stage for patterns that uh, become ingrained over time, which can contribute to weight gain. And interestingly, we're, we saw some of these links between weight stigma and unhealthy coping responses during COVID as well. So we published a study from um, that cohort I mentioned called Project EAT. And data were collected in the spring and summer of 2020 to look at young people's health behaviors during the pandemic. And we found that pre-pandemic experiences um, of weight stigma that young people reported back in 2018 predicted worse eating and distress during the COVID outbreak compared to those who had not been stigmatized about their weight. Specifically, those who reported that weight stigma in 2018 had a much higher level of using food and eating as a coping strategy for dealing with stress, and they were binge eating much more frequently. Now, in addition to um, the ways that youth cope with stigma, another key way in which stigma can worsen health behaviors is, th is through how people interpret those stigmatizing situations that they experience. And it's through a process called internalization of weight bias. So what can happen is when people experience weight stigma, 
that the negative societal judgments that they face can become an internalized process of negative self-judgment and self-blame. So internalizing stigma happens when people are aware of weight-based stereotypes and they apply those beliefs to themselves and engage in self-directed stigma and personal blame. And why this matters is that research shows that internalizing weight stigma can have the same negative health consequences as the experience of weight stigma. And in fact, we're starting to see that self-blame and, and self-stigma are actually predicting poor health even more than the experience of being stigmatized. We also see that internalizing weight stigma is related to worse coping strategies when, when stigma occurs, like turning to disordered eating. So internalization has important implications for how we address this. And Emerging research with youth and adolescent samples, both community samples and, and treatment seeking, shows that they also internalize and blame themselves for the weight-based teasing and bullying that they experience, and that this internalization is similarly associated with negative health behaviors and psychosocial consequences like binge eating and low self-esteem and psychological distress and behavioral problems. So this is something that we need to be looking out for and addressing with children as well. So this evidence collectively shows us the ways in which weight stigma may ultimately contribute to weight gain and obesity, um, because the psychosocial distress of experiencing weight stigma can really give way to both unhealthy coping strategies to deal with that distress, as well as internalization of stigma. And both of these reinforce unhealthy eating behaviors and low physical activity, which can contribute to weight gain. And this ultimately creates a harmful cycle because increased weight gain makes youth more vulnerable to experiencing weight stigma. And I think this uh, really underscores why it's so important for us to recognize that weight stigma is a public health issue itself. It, it does impair health and quality of life for many youth. And even though weight stigma is often viewed as a consequence of having obesity, it can also be a psychosocial contributor to obesity. Now, I, I want to also briefly highlight that this harmful feedback loop has relevance and, and pretty concerning implications for different populations who are also confronting other health issues or stigmatized identities. So we've examined links between weight stigma and health behaviors in sexual and gender minority adolescents. And this slide summarizes a study that we did with a large sample of sexual and gender minority adolescents where we found that weight-based teasing was very common across diverse body sizes of these youth. So if you look at this table here, you can see that the highest rates of weight-based teasing were experienced by those adolescents with the highest body weight. But also look at how high the percentages are at lower body weight categories, even underweight body sizes. And so this highlights the importance of recognizing that weight stigma is not only about having obesity, that it really can affect youth um, at different body sizes and weights. You might also notice here that high rates of these youth report being teased about their weight, not only in school, but also from family members, which adds to the struggles that these kids are facing. And in this particular um, study, we found that weight teasing um, significantly increased the odds of many negative health behaviors, whether it was maladaptive eating behaviors like binge eating or using food to cope with stress, but also worse mental health, lower self-esteem, higher depressive symptoms, and higher levels of stress. And, and these health consequences occurred, again, regardless of their body weight, reinforcing that weight stigma can have negative implications for health regardless of body size. So, so we're seeing these links between weight stigma and worse eating behaviors and poor mental health and vulnerable populations. And, you know, I think what's concerning here is that we know that these adolescents are already being stigmatized for their sexual or gender identity. So they have multiple stigmatized identities, which can compound their health consequences. So given these negative health impacts of weight stigma and the prevalence of this problem, how do we better support youth and improve pediatric care for children and adolescents who are vulnerable to weight stigma? Well, the framework for the strategies that I'm gonna talk about come from a policy statement that I co-authored with several colleagues that we published um, in uh, pediatrics. It was a, a policy statement endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics a few years ago. And this was the first statement that the AAP put out on weight stigma in youth. And we made a number of clinical practice recommendations for ways to address weight stigma. And these include things like increasing awareness of weight bias, giving careful consideration to language and weight communication, uh, making sure that weight stigma is on your radar as part of behavioral change counseling and behavioral health screening, and taking steps to reduce and avoid weight stigma in the clinical care setting. So I'm going to briefly summarize each of these. 
So first of all, we need to start with our own personal attitudes and assumptions about body weight. Uh, we certainly all make assumptions and these can unintentionally affect the quality of interactions with our patients. On a general level, we need to think critically about what those assumptions are and to challenge those assumptions and examine how do we interact with patients of different body sizes. So you can start by thinking about how you feel when you interact with youth and families of, of different body weights and how your views about weight can affect things like your body language or your facial expressions or your comments. And with what I think complicates this picture and our ability to really effectively address stigma in clinical practice is that weight stigma is actually a considerable problem in the healthcare setting. So several decades of research have documented evidence of weight stigma um, among medical providers. And this often occurs as negative and stereotypical attitudes that are expressed by healthcare providers towards patients with obesity. Um, stereotypes that have been documented among providers include the same views that we see in the general population. So views that uh, patients who have obesity are lazy, lacking in self-control, non-compliant with treatment, awkward, sloppy, unsuccessful, et cetera. And, and these attitudes have been documented by a range of healthcare provider specialties. So doctors, mental health professionals, dietitians, you know, students training in these professional health disciplines. And it does appear that patients are aware of these attitudes in their healthcare providers. So as an example from our own research, these are three of our studies here with large samples of primarily adults who have higher weight. And when we ask if they've experienced weight stigma from a healthcare professional, you can see how high these percentages are. Um, and in particular among doctors, but, but also among other healthcare professionals like nurses and mental health professionals. And what we see is that these biases appear to be present long before healthcare professionals enter clinical practice. So this slide shows a study of uh, uh, 5,800 first-year medical students from 49 medical schools in the U.S. The majority of these students expressed both explicit and implicit weight bias, especially among students who were male, white, or Hispanic, and with a lower BMI. So this bias is present before students enter training, and this tells us that we need to be addressing weight stigma early on in medical training. Now, also, as part of increasing our awareness about this issue within the healthcare community, we need to be increasing our understanding and awareness of the etiology of obesity. So a number of studies show that when we attribute the causes of obesity to personal factors like lack of discipline or willpower, that that increases weight stigma. But when people understand the complex causes of obesity to include additional factors beyond personal control, like the environment or genetics, stigma is reduced. Um, and, and the truth is that obesity is extremely complex and personal behaviors are only one factor. And this is something that we need to acknowledge as health professionals, both to ourselves, but also to our patients, because when patients become aware of these complex factors that are involved in body weight regulation, not only does it reduce their self-blame, but it actually increases their self-efficacy for making health behavior changes. Now, as it stands, though, many adolescents and parents view stigma as a real barrier to wanting to participate in treatment or for weight management. Um, parents are concerned that providers aren't going to discuss weight in a sensitive way with their child, and, and they don't want this treatment to damage their child's self-esteem. And children and adolescents feel like they're going to be made fun of by their peers and humiliated if they have to do things like exercise in front of others. And they really just want support to help them increase their self-esteem. So we need to really have increased awareness of weight stigma as a barrier to care. And we're starting to see recognition of this in the pediatric obesity field. Um, this graphic I've highlighted um, shows this nicely, which identifies a number of legitimate barriers to effective care for pediatric obesity. Weight stigma is one of the spokes on this wheel, and it must be addressed alongside these other barriers. And we need to see this kind of recognition um, across different aspects of pediatric care, because we know that weight stigma does permeate the health environment in different ways. Now, the second um, and highly important strategy to address weight stigma in clinical practice is how we communicate about body weight. So we need to think carefully about whether the language we use, even if it's unintentional or indirectly, is contributing to uh, bias or blame. And this means thinking about the moral tone of the words we use and using language that is supportive and empowering to our patients. Providers sometimes feel unsure about how to talk about body weight. And the goal is really to use language that is respectful and supportive and empowering. Um, and so how do we do this? Let's, let's look more closely at this. 
So my team has examined implications of the words that healthcare providers use when talking about body weight. And we started off with some research with parents where we provided parents with a list of words commonly used to refer to um, excess body weight in children. And for each word, we asked them to rate how stigmatizing or blaming they felt the word was and how motivating or unmotivating it was for encouraging their child to lose weight if a doctor used it in a medical appointment context with their child. What you see here is that the words that were viewed to be most stigmatizing and blaming were words like fat and morbidly obese, where words that parents viewed to be the least stigmatizing and blaming were more neutral words like weight, unhealthy weight, and high BMI. We also asked these parents how they would react if a doctor used stigmatizing language to refer to their child's weight. We see that about a third of parents would feel upset, about a third would seek a new doctor for their child, and about a quarter would avoid future medical appointments for their child altogether. So you can start to see how language has implications even for things like healthcare utilization. Now, we've also examined adolescents' preferences for language about weight. And in several studies um, that we did with adolescents with high BMI, we asked them what words they would most want healthcare providers or family members to use when talking to them about their weight. And we asked them how they would feel in response to parents using different words. So we gave them a list of about 16 different words and they rated each one. And here's what we found. Similar to our work with adults, we see that adolescents prefer neutral words from both healthcare providers and parents. So words like weight, BMI, even weight problem, but not words like obese, fat, or large. We also found that when parents used various words to describe their adolescence weight, that this resulted in emotional distress, particularly for girls. So specifically parents who refer to their daughter's weight as fat or obese or overweight or large, resulted in a, a significant amount of girls feeling embarrassed, sad, and ashamed. Now, again, boys did exhibit these emotional responses as well, but just at lower percentages. Now, more recently, we've studied terminology preferences in a very large community sample of over 2,000 adolescents. And, and this new study is coming out um, this month, actually, in pediatrics. And for this study, we, we looked at youth between the ages of 10 and 17, and we had a very racially and ethnically diverse uh, sample. And what we found is that over half of adolescents indicate that they never want their parents to use words like extremely obese, obese, fat, plus size, or high BMI. And again, the most preferred terms were, were words that were more neutral, like healthy weight or weight. But we did see some differences across demographics. So for example, words like curvy were not surprisingly more preferred by girls, but also by sexual minority adolescents. Words like large and big were preferred more by boys and youth with higher BMI. And the word thick was preferred more by youth with the highest BMI and youth who identified as um, Black African American and Hispanic Latinx. Then also in this study, the list of terms that you see here on the left of the slide induced the most negative emotions in adolescents with about one third feeling ashamed or sad or embarrassed if their parents use these words to refer to their weight. Uh, we didn't really see any differences here based on adolescent weight status, and only a couple of differences emerged for um, race and ethnicity. Um, and we also saw that girls tended to express more negative reactions than boys for about a third of the terms that, that we asked them about. Um, and similarly, um, more weight terms elicited negative reactions from sexual minority relative to heterosexual adolescents. So you know, there are some similarities here in adolescent preferences and, and their emotional reactions to terminology, but a key insight from this work is that word preferences actually differed quite a bit according to adolescents' gender and race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. And so this highlights that as pediatric professionals, we need to avoid making assumptions about what language is best to use when we're having a discussion about weight with youth and families. And we need to acknowledge that people have diverse views about this. And so a way to initiate this conversation to respect that diversity and that individual variation is to simply ask the patient, could we talk about your weight today? Followed by an acknowledgement that teens have different preferences for how to refer to their bodies and, and how comfortable they are having these conversations. And then asking, what words would you feel most comfortable using while we talk about this? So really um, using their preferred words in that dialogue can lead to a more supportive and productive conversation. Now, another consideration in improving communication, especially in the context of obesity care, is the use of people-first language in the healthcare setting. 
So people first language involves um, avoiding labeling people by their condition or disease. It's been adopted with many health conditions and illnesses. So rather than referring to the obese child, you would say the child who has obesity or the child with obesity. Uh, this is becoming an accepted standard by a number of health organizations and obesity research journals. And, and it can be helpful to consider this language when you're communicating with other providers or medical professionals about patients with obesity. Now, if you have more questions about weight-related language, um, I can point you to a recent systematic review on this topic published in 2020. And it, it essentially summarizes what we know from a fairly scattered literature on word preferences among adolescents and adults in the context of healthcare interactions. Um, what this review also highlights though, is that there's a lot that we still don't know about language when it comes to body weight. And you know, the work that's been done so far um, has been lacking in sample diversity and there just isn't uh, much research yet on, on youth perspectives of what kinds of words they feel most comfortable with. Okay, so the third clinical recommendation from the AAP policy statement on weight stigma involves considering this issue in the context of behavior change counseling. So we can help reduce weight stigma by practicing patient-centered and empathic approaches when we're talking about weight-related health and use approaches like motivational interviewing techniques, which can really empower and support children and families to make health behavior changes. Um, I think it's also very helpful to engage youth collaboratively in team decision-making about specific weight-related health goals for them and strategies to address those. And I'm not really going to spend more time on this here since I'm sure you're all very well versed in these approaches, but, but simply to say that we need to make sure we're using patient-centered approaches as one of our tools to reduce weight stigma. And that support of language is also very important in behavior change counseling because too often youth and parents are feeling blamed and shamed, and we want them to be feeling supported in making health behavior changes. Now, the fourth clinical recommendation uh, pertains to addressing weight stigma in the context of behavioral health screening. So we know that many youth attending pediatric care for obesity are experiencing weight-based teasing and bullying. And so it can be very helpful for pediatric providers to assess youth for not just the medical comorbidities of obesity, but the emotional comorbidities as well, including teasing and bullying, um, self-esteem, school attendance and performance, depression, anxiety, Sometimes these get overlooked, but they can be uh, frequent signs that a child is experiencing weight-based bullying. And more specifically, I think providers can ask different kinds of questions to help determine whether a child is being teased or bullied about their weight. So asking questions like, how do you feel when you're at school? And what's the thing that makes you feel most angry? And how do you handle that? Or what makes you worried or most sad? Um, these kinds of probes can, can help children and adolescents disclose potential experiences of victimization. If a patient does report these experiences, it's important to then identify whether there is a support system in place. And that includes trying to get a sense of what are the family interactions about weight at home and who in the family is supportive and who may be teasing the child at home and, and how do they even talk about weight at home. It's also important to share concerns with parents and to um, encourage parents to contact their child's school administrators if bullying is reported. And it, it also may be appropriate to make a mental health referral if you have concerns about the child's emotional distress. One thing I do just wanna highlight again here though, is that weight-based bullying can occur in youth at diverse body sizes. So it's not just those with a high level of obesity. Even kids at a healthier weight report these experiences. So it is important to be screening and assessing these issues in, in most um, cases. Now, what I sometimes get asked from providers is what to do if parents themselves are making disparaging comments about their child's weight during the appointment. That can be a difficult thing to navigate and, and difficult to know what to do, but I do think it provides a, an important opportunity for dialogue and to educate parents on ways to be more supportive and helpful at home. So first, as a provider, you can model respect, respectful and sensitive language about weight. So use the kinds of language that you want to see parents using. Second, you can acknowledge that parents often feel frustrated and conflicted about how best to help their child, but that critical comments usually backfire and can have a negative impact. And so this can be a time to discuss with parents strategies to increase emotional support, like listening to their child's concerns, helping their child label their feelings, removing blame, uh, focusing on health, not just appearance. And then you can also talk about parenting strategies that can be more effective, like creating a home environment that, pro that promotes healthy food choices, praising children for healthy decision-making, 
uh, focusing on improving health behaviors, not just weight, and modeling health behaviors that they want their children to adopt. And then finally, the fifth clinical recommendation from the AAP policy statement has to do with addressing weight stigma in the physical office environment. And there are fairly straightforward steps that can be taken to ensure that the clinical setting is one that is both supported and, and welcoming to youth and families of diverse body sizes. And we actually have a checklist um, available for this on our website at yukonrodcenter.org. And it includes things like this. So essentially um, assuring that equipment like beds, wheelchairs, exam tables have proper stability and weight capacity, using correctly sized medical instruments like blood pressure cuffs and robes, having well-configured doorways or hallways or restrooms that patients can easily be mobile in, and having a waiting room with a variety of sturdy armless seating options. You can also think about what kinds of reading materials you have in the waiting room. Are they fashion magazines that emphasize things like ideals of thinness or physical appearance? Or are there reading materials that maybe don't emphasize weight or portray people of diverse body sizes? And um, I do wanna point your attention to some free educational resources that we have developed to really help healthcare providers have supportive and productive conversations um, with patients about weight-related health. Um, these and other educational resources about weight stigma are available for free online through the Rudd Center's website, and that includes informational slides and handouts and training webinars, um, educational videos, um, really on the kinds of topics that I've highlighted today. And um, we also have resources specifically for parents, including a number of um, handouts to really help parents understand what weight stigma is, how it impacts their child, and what they can do to create a more supportive home environment. So I encourage you to take a look at these materials. And then finally, I, I want to highlight that efforts to address weight stigma are not limited to the medical office or the clinical practice setting. So there are broader things that we can do to help reduce societal weight bias and to protect youth. And in the AAP policy statement that I've been mentioning, there are a series of advocacy-related strategies that providers can engage in to help address this issue. Uh, and these include things like advocating for training and education about weight bias in professional health disciplines, um, advocating for respectful portrayals of youth with diverse body sizes in the media, which typically just reinforce negative social stereotypes, and then doing what we can at the policy level to ensure that anti-bullying policies in schools adequately protect students from weight-based bullying. So in summary, there are many opportunities for us to intervene to help children and adolescents and prevent the harms of weight stigma. Uh, we can increase awareness amongst ourselves and our colleagues about weight stigma and its harmful health consequences. We can practice and implement sensitive and respectful communication about weight-related health, and we can engage in clinical strategies that support youth in health behavior change. And I really do think we should all be advocating more broadly outside of the clinical setting as well to cre create a more supportive environment for children of all body sizes. And I will stop there to give us a little bit of time for questions and discussion. I'd like to uh, thank you for your time and attention today. Um, and certainly, if you'd like to learn more about the work that we're doing, you can visit our website at yukonrudcenter.org, or you can feel free to reach out to me directly. Thank you. Dr. Poole, that was an excellent presentation and really appreciate um, all the resources that you provided for us. There are several um, questions in the chat room, if you wouldn't mind uh, addressing those. Um, one is, uh, what are your thoughts on commercial weight loss programs such as GOLO, Nutrisystem, Noom, et cetera? Well, when we're talking about youth and the messages that they're exposed to, I think that these kinds of programs can be um, very harmful with their messages. And in fact, a lot of these programs use um, before and after pictures of people with weight loss. And what we know from a stigma research perspective is that when people see those, those images, those before and after images, that, that actually increases weight stigma. It worsens um, attitudes. So, you know, there, there's two pieces of this. One is 